And welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking the time tonight to come hear a message from the Bible. And so that's what we're going to turn to first is in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. It's a very well-known verse, and I'm going to focus in on the last part of the verse, but we'll read the whole verse. 1 John 1 and 7, and this is what it says. It says there, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that's the Lord Jesus we're speaking about, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the focus part I want to focus in on tonight. Listen to that again. The blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, this verse was written to Christians. So it is a, it is a, 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 a fact given to the Christians. But it is also a, a lesson for all of us. And it is a lesson, particularly for those that are not saved, those that are maybe listening tonight and you don't know of having your sins cleansed or all your sins forgiven. Don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this verse says that you can have your sins forgiven, cleansed 100 percent. Eleven words, eleven words that can change your life and change your destiny forever. But these are wonderful words, but it's not all about the words in the word of God, it is actually about the person that the words are speaking about. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's our desire tonight is to, to proclaim Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. So I just want to consider four things about this verse. The very first thing I want to talk about is the need. The need for cleansing. The need for having our sins forgiven. The second point I want to talk about is the source. Look, where? Where do we go for this cleansing? The, the third point is the cost, the cost of cleansing. And we're going to talk about how it doesn't cost us. It's it's cost the Lord Jesus Christ, his life on the cross. And then we're going to talk about the totality or the, the completeness of the cleansing of sin. There was this young man. His name was Tyson Steele. He um, liked to live in Alaska and he, he liked to go to remote areas in Alaska. And he had a little cabin out there and, he was out in his remote little area in, in the freezing cold. Not something I would probably really find myself doing. But anyways, this is what he enjoyed doing. But unfortunately, tragedy struck and a fire started in his little cabin. And it burnt his cabin down. And for, um, I think it was about 20 some days, 23 days, he tried to survive. It was so cold and and uh, his, his uh, food resources were limited and so on. Until finally, he's decided, you know what, I, I need help. And so in the snow, he found a bunch of sticks and stones and stuff. And in the snow, he, he wrote SOS in great big letters. And eventually, someone, a helicopter was flying over, and uh, they uh, were able to see it and come down and rescue him. I wonder what it had been like uh, to, for him to hear that helicopter and hear it come and then come closer and closer and closer. Must have been such relief. Such um, a joy would have come over his heart that I'm going to live. I'm going to survive this. I know, you know, this is kind of the same idea when it comes to salvation. In the turmoil of our sin, in the weight of our sin, the burden of our sin, to understand that we can hear the Lord Jesus. We can see him. He's the one who has come to rescue us. What joy it is in our hearts to know that our sins can be forgiven. Maybe there's somebody today and you're listening. You know what? I can look back to a day. Myself, I can look back to a day uh, 37 years ago, just a little while ago, on August 9th, when I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and, and the joy in my heart to know my sins are all forgiven. And maybe there's some of you listening, you think you could you could think of a time, not necessarily it has to be a time in the calendar, that's not really the important part, but the important part is you can understand, you could appreciate that Jesus Christ has forgiven you of all your sins and what joy comes over your heart. But maybe there's somebody listening right now and, and you don't have that. You don't have that joy in your heart to know that your sins are forgiven. And I want to speak to you tonight that you have a great need. That's the very first point. A great need. A need of having your sins forgiven. You see, there's a verse in Isaiah 64, verse 6. I'm going to read this to you. This is what it says. We've all become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. We fade like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. This verse here describes us and what sin has done. The very first thing from this verse we can understand is that it's our fault. 
It says, we have all become. Somebody else hasn't made us sinners. Somebody else hasn't made us sin. It is what we are inside. So I am responsible for my own sin. And you are responsible for your sin. It's not someone else's fault. Sometimes you might think, well, you know, as Adam, because he first sinned and then sinned him into the world. That's very true. But still, I am responsible for my own sin. Then I commit myself personally. And so are you. But then the next thing goes and it talks about how that even our good deeds are stained with sin. A while ago, I was shopping at a discount store and poking out some T-shirts and so on. And I found this T-shirt. I thought it was a nice T-shirt. So it was like three bucks. I was like, wow, I love getting deals like that. And uh, I started standing in line um, and I started going through a couple other T-shirts I had. And I picked up that one. I'm a perfect T-shirt. But up on the collar down here somewhere, there was this little spot. And uh, it, it kind of looked like an ink blot or something, whatever it was. And I thought, well, it was a white T-shirt with a blotch on it. I'm like, it's a perfectly good T-shirt. But that one little spot ruined the whole T-shirt. And I didn't buy it. I wasn't going to spend $3 on a shirt that wasn't even 3 bucks. I, I wasn't going to do it because it ruined the whole thing. You see, that's what we are in the presence of God. We sometimes think, well, we have, we can present God with a, with a clear slate. It's the best we can do. We can't. That's what our, this verse says. All of our good deeds are even affected by sin. We have that little mark of sin on even the good deeds. And we cannot present something to God. It's our fault. And sin affects our good deeds. Not only that, it, it makes us fade. We fade like a leaf. A leaf shrivels up. A, a leaf changes. And, and it doesn't become as, as beautiful as it was. And that's what sin does to us. You see, you and I have a purpose. We are put on this planet to glorify God, our maker. Well, that makes sense. God made us, and he made us so that we would glorify him, so we would show forth his beauty. But sin has come in, and sin has affected that, has made it so that we're not able to glorify God. We're not able to please him, and that's the effect of sin. And then it has caused us to drift, to fall away. And that's what a leaf does. It's kind of the idea. It falls away. We've fallen away. And as we go on in life, we fall away and we get further and further away from God. Now, this is the description of us in our sin. And it is a very serious description. And it is a, a description that tells us that we need our sins to be forgiven. Now, how do we go about that forgiveness is the big question. But the very first part we have to understand is, am I a sinner? Am I, is my, are my sins serious? You see, I have four children and um, I do my best. My wife and I, we do our best to teach our children that there's consequences to doing wrong. Um, the timeout chair or, or go to your room or whatever it might be, or do a chore, whatever. You see, we want to ingrained in our children's minds is that you can't deliberately do something wrong and then and get away with it i mean you imagine if that was society it, it would be it would be bad you can't do something wrong and get away with it and that, that's the idea of, of our sin we can't just continue on in our sin and just think we're going to get away with it this is how serious it is we cannot get away from with our sin we might be able to hide it from certain ones. We can hide it from our parents. We can hide it from our teacher. We can hide it from our boss. We can hide it from many different people. We cannot hide from God. And he knows our sin. He knows us through and through. And since he knows our sin, all of our sin must be punished. Every single last one of our sins must be punished. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says the wrath of God abides over us. It's the wrath of God against our sin abides over us it's hanging over us it hasn't fallen yet if you're still alive and you're still living this enjoying your life the wrath of god hasn't fallen yet on you be thankful for that but it makes it real to know that the wrath of god is there for your sin so how great is the need of having your sins removed or forgiven or cleansed it is it is so great it is so great that it needs to be done today today 
Now, there's a, a pastor, and he was going into a restaurant once, and he sat down with an older lady to try and talk to her about the gospel. And uh, he said to the lady, she says, so um, what do you think about I, I, What do you think about God and heaven? And she goes, oh, I, I want to go to heaven so bad, but there's something in the way. And the pastor goes, well, what, what is it? She goes, it's my sin. And the pastor goes, wow, that, that that's great. Like, he was kind of almost excited, this, this woman already recognized the fact that her sin was a problem. She, and the woman says, you know, I see my sin is a great big boulder in front of me between me, myself and God. And he's like, that's right. It is. And then she goes, and then he said, so what are you going to do about that, that great big boulder of sin between you and God? She says, well, I'm, I've got like a, a, a chisel and a hammer. And every day I, I, I just do something good and I just try and chip away at it. You know, the pastor asked her, so how are you doing? She says, I'm not doing very well at all. He took that opportunity to tell her that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who took that boulder of sin at the cross. I don't know if you got saved or not, but if you can only come to understand the seriousness of your sin, then it needs to be cleansed. And then you go to the next part. We'll talk about the source of our sin, the source of the one who can cleanse our sins. Since it's not us. The Bible makes it very sure. He says, we are without strength, Romans 5 and 6. We are without strength. Doesn't mean that we have a little bit of strength. No, we have no strength at all to cleanse us of our own sin. We cannot do it ourselves. So therefore, we have to look outside of ourselves. Now, where do we go to? Well, the thing we got to understand is, there's something we have to understand is, we need to go to one who knows about our sin. I can't go to somebody who doesn't know the sin I've committed. And I myself actually might forget the sins I've committed or might not think I've committed a sin, but I actually have. I can't go to my friend David Zunim and say, can you cleanse me of my sins? First of all, he has his own sins and he doesn't know all my sins. So I need to go to someone who knows all my sins. That's God. God knows them all. Now, it's a scary thing to think that he knows all my sins and he must punish them all. But it's also a comforting thing to know that he knows all my sins. Therefore, he can cleanse them all. Isn't that wonderful? So we need to go to God. Now, how what what is the standard for this cleansing? Does it does it does I ha, do I have to have a, a certain percentage of cleansing? So who sets the standard? Do I rely on someone else to set the standard of how many sins I need to be? No, I look to God. Since God knows all my sins and he can cleanse me of all my sins, therefore he knows how much cleansing I need. See, this is what happens when it comes to salvation. God does it all. I remember a time uh, a while ago, my father-in-law and I, we we're going to go golfing. We we're, we we're on vacation in Florida. So we thought, let's go for golfing. So I got my shorts and my T-shirt on. And my father-in-law had his jeans and his and his uh, T-shirt on. So we went off to golf. And I'm like, we don't know any of the area. So we just drive into a golf course and walk in. And we said, uh, we'd like to uh, get a golf clubs and stuff and cart for two, please. They're like, um, I'm not too sure if that's going to work. I'm like, oh, we're going to pay. It's not like, <laughs> they're like, uh, no, um, jeans are not allowed. And um, you have to have a, a collared shirt. You can't have a T-shirt. And so I, I was kind of astonished. Uh, I'm not used to that kind of class. And uh, so my father and I, and I just, we left. They wouldn't let us golf. Because we didn't have the right attire on. Now, I could have stood there and said, wait a minute, come on, that's ridiculous. And I could have argued with them and stuff. But you know what? They have the right. They have the absolute right to set the standard for the golf course, what I should wear. They own it. Why can't they tell me what to wear when I want to play golf there? They have, they have the full right. So does God. God owns heaven. Actually, God made you and I. And if he wants, if you want, if you want to be in the presence of God, therefore we have to meet God's standard and he has the full right to set the standard. I had so many conversations with people. Then I say, how are you going to get to heaven? So I'm going to do the best I can. Well, what is the best you can? Like, I need to know a percentage, 75%, 50%, 99%, what, 100%, what is the best you can? Well, no, everyone knows they can't do 100%. So, well, I don't know. It's just the best I can. Well, who determines the best? is that you can do who determines that is it you is it me you see if we look to ourselves to set our own standard well then 
things get out of control. I could say to myself, you know what? I'm seven feet tall. I, I'm not. But according to my standard, I am. Why well, just make up a standard? I have to go by the standard that's already set by the measuring tape. And I'm not six feet tall. I'm not seven feet tall. I'm 5'11". You see, I can't make up my own standard. And God says, there's no sin in heaven. Revelation says, there's no sin that shall, nothing in heaven shall defile it. Nothing. <clears throat> so therefore, no sin is allowed in heaven. And all sin must be punished. Therefore, let's go to the source. And the source is Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And he came to this earth. He knows my sin fully, all of it. He knows how much punishment is required for my sins, all of it. He knows it full well. So he is the one I have to look to. Now, what is the cost of my forgiveness, of my cleansing? Oh, if I could only put this into terms. I know I'm going to fail describing what it costs Jesus Christ. To take that boulder of sin away. You see, I was just thinking today. If you were going to, if, if, if in life there was something I was going to take, I was going to take something. And by taking it, I knew it was going to hurt me and cause me harm. I would do everything I could to not take it. I would do everything I could to avoid taking it. I would not even touch it. I would stay away from it. If I knew if I took that, then it's actually going to hurt me physically, emotionally, spiritually. It's going to hurt me. I wouldn't take it. I want you to think of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus existed outside of time. He existed in eternity. What that means is that Jesus Christ lived in the past forever. He lives in the present and he lives in the future as if it already happened. He's outside of time. Yet it was his decision, his choice to take a body and to come to this earth, this puny speck of dust, and to come to this earth and live a perfect life. And he knew what was going to happen to his body. He knew his body was going to be destroyed. He knew his body was going to be whipped in the back, ripped open like a plow field. He knew his body, the crown of thorns would be put on his head and blood would be pouring down and the thorns would be beaten into his head. He knew that his hair, the beard on his face would be ripped off. What agony, what suffering. He knew he was going to get hit in the face and spat in the face. He knew that his hands and his feet were going to be nailed to the cross. He knew of all the emotional turmoil he was going to go through. He knew he was going to be forsaken. He knew he was going to be mocked at and laughed at. He knew all these things, every single last bit of it. And yet he still took himself a body so that he might become the bearer of sin. So he might bear all all the sin and all the punishment because he knows all the sin and he knows all the punishment and he's, he was able to bear it on the cross and there on the cross the lord jesus christ submitted himself to death you see he's the one who's the source of life he's the one who gives us breath he's the one who is the one who made life and brought life into existence and continues to maintain life He's not the source of death, yet he submitted himself into death and took the ultimate death of our sins that deserve punishment in hell forever. And he bore that death on the cross so that you don't, you don't have to and I don't have to. Remember when I said the wrath of God is abiding over us? Here's us. The wrath of God is abiding over us. About to fall. Hasn't fallen yet. But what God has done, and he's moved it away from us, and he's moved it onto his son, and his son bore it all on the cross. So now here I am. No longer. It's gone. The wrath of God against my sin is gone. Why? Because Jesus Christ bore it all on the cross. He shed his blood. That's what our verse said. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. He shed his blood freely for you and for me.
there was a, a man that got in trouble by the uh, Saudi Arabia government, and he was sentenced to a thousand lashings. A thousand lashings. I don't know what a lashing is all involved in a lashing, but I can only imagine. And he's going to be sentenced to a thousand of them. Some of his friends, a whole bunch of his friends, a hundred of his friends got together. And they said, uh, uh, sorry, no, was it 10 of his friends? 10 of his friends got together and they wrote a letter to the government. And they sent the letter off. And in the letter, it said this. It said, talk about the unjust of the punishment and so on. He says, but at the end of it, he says, but if you feel, feel that you must fall through this punishment, please let us each take, uh, each of us take a hundred lashings. 10 friends came. They said, I want to take 100 lashings. So therefore, if each of those friends got to take 100 lashings, how many lashings would be left for, his name was Rafid. How many, la how many lashings would be left for him? Zero. That'd be pretty remarkable, isn't it? That they offered themselves to take the lashings for their friend. The government rejected them. No. Rafid had to take his lashings himself. I want to tell you something that God has not rejected the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God has not rejected what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And why should you? I want to conclude with this final point is that is, um, is uh, the totality of the cleansing. This is so awesome. This is such an important part of the verse. It comes down to one little word. It says the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin so i might be saying why how could it, all my sin be cleansed when i have even i might commit one tomorrow or the next day in the future want to know something when jesus christ died on the cross all your sins your future all of them i remember i said jesus existed outside of time so he knows the future as if he's already there so he knows the future he knows all your sin he knows your entire life and he was able to bear it on the cross what a beautiful thing to know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, past, present, and future. I wonder, is there somebody here just maybe thinking, well, then how do I, um, how do I get it, the good of this? How, how do I become saved? How do I have my sins forgiven? And the Bible explains it this way is is through faith faith in the lord jesus christ and maybe there's somebody who's struggling i struggle with this too was the idea of faith belief i i don't know how to take that step i don't know what what, what to do well i'm just going to try to give you this illustration and maybe help you understand and uh, um let's just do a simple math scenario okay let's say uh, uh 10 plus something 10 plus blank equals 10. what would you put in that blank well, I think everybody here would say, well, 10 plus 5 is not going to work. 10 plus 1 is not going to work. 10 plus 0.1 is not going to work. It has to be 10 plus 0 equals 10, right? And then you, if we want to simple it, the best of simplest is it's 10 equals 10, right? And then you put a big check mark. Yep, check mark. Right. That is right. 10 plus 5 or whatever else equals 10, that's an X. That's not right. But 10 equals 10, yes, that's right. Now, let's take that scenario and put it to salvation. The cross of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ done on the cross, died for our sins. Plus something equals eternal life. What would you put in the something? The cross plus my prayers equals eternal life? No. The cross plus my good works equals eternal life? No. The cross plus my church membership equals eternal life? No. And we could go on. You have to come to the conclusion, no. The cross plus plus nothing equals eternal life. The cross equals eternal life, right? Check mark. That is correct. I'm going to go one step further. The cross plus your faith equals eternal life. Is that right? No, it's wrong. The cross plus your believing equals eternal life. No, that's wrong. You see, it's what we got in our mind. We think, well, my believing is going to add to the cross. No, it does not. The cross equals eternal life. So then where does it, where does my believing fit? Because the Bible says I have to believe. I have to faith. It's the check mark. You see, the cross equals eternal life. 
and the check mark is saying, yes, that's correct. That's faith. Correct, because God says it. God has done the work. It is correct. I agree with God. That's what faith is. Faith is placing your trust in who God is and what he has done on the cross for you. One last time, listen to this. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. I trust there might be somebody who might put themselves into that verse. Understand that Jesus' blood was shed for you.